I hope that everybody who wanted to be here is present. If I can just hear one, I can hear you from your side to be sure that you can hear me. Can, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, that's great. So, um, good, good, thank you. So, uh, first of all, greetings to you. Uh, my name is Andrei Shepchich, and I'm going to be your presenter today. Also helping me is uh, Mrs. Veronica Tedesco and Mr. Simone Menegin. We are all from ISA Altanova. And today we will talk about tan delta measurement. And we will do what we call a beginner's session, which will be followed by advanced session, which will happen next Monday on the 20th. So I hope that all of you who are present right now will also be present next Monday when we will be diving a little bit deeper into Tan Delta and all the questions and all the answers connected with it. So let me first give you an idea that uh, who I am. So I am a regional area manager inside the Altanova. I'm an electrical engineer. I graduated in 2008, and for six years, I was a commissioning engineer, mostly commissioning SCADA systems and protective relays. Since I started working for ESA about eight years ago, my experience has expanded to primary equipment, and today I'm uh, responsible also not just for the systems uh, like protective relays, but I also handle a lot of transformer testing, circuit breaker testing, and recently I started with partial discharge. So, uh, with the help of my friends, I would like to think that I get, gathered quite a lot of experience when it comes to Tan Delta, and today I will do my best to give you an idea what uh, what have I learned? So before we proceed, let me just hit the record button. So we're recording this now on two levels. As I said before, I'm going to repeat the video of this webinar as well as the PowerPoint presentation will be sent to you. And uh, so no need to, to ask for that. I mean, it will be shared because we want to share our knowledge. Uh, I would like to thank also many people who have asked about how is the situation in Italy due to the situation right now, uh, taking into account the corona, let me say, infestation. We in both ISA and in, um, in Bologna, uh, in, in Zola Predosa are good. As much as I know, we don't have any of any of our employees are uh, infected and we are successfully proceeding with the business. Of course, most of us work from home, apart from the brave ones who are working in a production. But concretely this week, because there are Easter holidays, the factories are on a Easter vacation, let, let us say vacation, because in these days, uh, this line between a vacation and working from home has been a little bit blurred. I hope that we will have a chance to meet all of us, maybe when I come and visit you in your countries uh, after this is done, after obviously we learn something which we need to learn in order not to have these situations again. And speaking about learning, I would like that today we learn even more from the experience which I managed to gather about tan delta. So let us start. What is tan delta and why do we measure it? So tan delta is today the most common technique used to assess the insulation of primary equipment, primary equipment like a transformer, which means, oh, just a second, let me share it, you're right. Now we should see the video just a second. 
Okay, so I hope you see the video now. Please let me know if by any chance. No. Okay, okay, let's wait for it. Let's wait for it. Let's see. It's okay? Okay. So, what is tan delta and why do we measure it? So, tan delta, tan delta is, as we said, the most common technique used to assess the insulation of primary equipment like medium and high voltage transformers, but also current and voltage transformers, rotary machines like generators and motors, also cables, medium high voltage cables, circuit breakers, surge arresters, all type of primary equipment. Let us say anything that has an insulation can be tested using this method. It is important to emphasize also that this is an AC test. It is not a DC test. An AC test means, of course, that we will not be using a direct uh, current or direct voltage. We will be using alternate voltage and alternate current. Of course, there are different methods, but today we will be focusing on an AC test. And this test is used to check aging of insulation and also mechanical deformation. So this is just, in short, what you might expect from this, what you might expect from uh, this session today. And what we will do is we will actually, uh, let's say, do a kind of easy introduction to what we will be talking about today and on Monday. So since we talk about insulation, we know that today we have all types of insulation. We have thermal insulation, which you will use to insulate your house. We talk about sound insulation, which will be used, for example, in a studio when recording. But today we will talk about electrical insulation and we will be mostly focusing on transformers. Of course, as I said, it can be applied to many other assets, but due to the fact that uh, the transformers are a very good thing to take as an example when talking about sound delta, we will be focusing on transformers and in that we will be focusing on power transformers. Today, when we talk about insulation, so we have few types of insulation. We have a solid insulation, liquid insulation, and gases insulation. So solid would be cellulose, which is paper and press board, which is something which you will often find in a power transformer. For example, you can find it in a, uh, you can find it uh, while you wrapping the primary or the secondary winding. You can also uh, we can also use cast resin as a type of solid insulation and we can also use uh, porcelain which is very often which is very often used for example for bushings and similar uh, let's say uh, current and voltage transformers apart from that we also have the chance to use liquid insulation like mineral oils, silicon oil, uh, which is more expensive than the mineral oil, and all types of synthetic compounds, which are usually used with power transformers to insulate, and also cool down the transformer, the windings, the core, etc. And then we have gases insulation, and the gases insulation is something which for example, very often sulfur hexafluoride or electrogaz is often used since the 30s, 1930s, air and vacuum or nitrogen. So obviously these are all compounds, elements which are electrically inert, which don't, which are, uh, which don't conduct electricity. And when we talk about insulation, let us define it. If we want to talk about it, it's a good idea if we can define it. So we are defining the insulation as a material or a combination of materials, suitable non-conductive materials that provide electrical insulation of two parts at different voltages. So it's a very straightforward and quite understandable definition, but still let us focus on one element. Let us focus on the fact that um, 
material or a combination of suitable non-conducting materials. So what do we mean by this? Well, obviously, we can have only one material as an insulator. For example, it can be just a cast resin in a dry type transformer, or it can be porcelain in a bushing. But very often, in a power transformer, we will have a mix. We will have a mineral oil and a paper, or a mineral oil or, and paper, and a press board. So this is important because later we will refer to this definition and see why tan delta is so good. And I'll just give you a hint. It's good because it doesn't measure the insulating properties of only one material in this set of materials. It gives us an idea about the whole insulating system which we have installed. Now, I hope we have clarified this. The next thing which we will talk about is the end of the definition which says two parts at different voltages. So two parts at different voltages is, let us put it like this, if we have two different voltages, each on one side, and we have a dielectric or an insulator in between, does this sound familiar to you? Well, I hope it does, because it is a definition of a capacitor. And this is important because we will, we will use a capacitor today to model our insulation, to model the insulation so that we can assess. So, excuse me, somebody is saying that the video is not available. Can you confirm this? Is it okay? Okay, so maybe it was a poor connection. Okay. Uh, anyway, let us continue. So, since we were going to model today the insulation as a capacitor, let us take a look at what is actually a capacitor. So, all of us have an idea or maybe know very exactly what a capacitor is, but capacitor exactly is two conductive plates with a dielectric in between them. The capacitor has a certain area or the size and there is a distance between two plates and actually the characteristic of a capacitor is to store electrical charge. Now, why am I saying this? Well, I'm saying this because when the transformer, for example, was being built, even though the idea that there will be some capacitance, let us call it just for now a parasitic capacitance, will appear, it is there. It is a physical reality of any transformer because you can say that this is, for example, a high voltage winding and this is a low voltage winding. In between, you have some paper and some oil which constitute a dielectric, which in turn, whether we want it or not, constitutes a capacitor. So we could say that we can easily model an insulation as a capacitor. Or maybe it's not high and low voltage side on the transformer, maybe it's a high voltage and ground, or maybe low voltage and ground on some of the primary equipment. So whenever we have two different electrical potentials and the dielectric in between, we have a capacitor, something that can hold an electrical charge. Even if we have an overhead line, which is running above us, there is a parasitic capacitance between that line and the ground. Of course, it's a very small capacitance because the distance is very big, but it's there. And since it's there, let us use that to understand what is the state of our insulation. But in order to do that, we need to dig a little bit deeper we need to see the basic formula for a two-plate capacitor. So we can see here that we have a capacitance, we have a permeativity, the area and the distance. So the bigger the area and the bigger the permeativity and the smaller the distance between the plates, more electrons I can store inside. And this is the core of understanding tan delta because first of all, the permeativity is one thing which can change, of course, and it can change if, for example, the properties of our insulation changes. If our oil gets too much water molecules inside, the epsilon will change. Also, if there was an earthquake, heaven forbid, and the two plates or two windings have become more closer, then these two parameters will change. So we can have a permittivity which change 
which would constitute a problem with our insulation, or we can have A and D changing, which in turn would mean something else. It, means, it could mean that something physically moved inside, or maybe all of them can change. Maybe we have bad insulation due to the, let's say, gases inside, and something physically moved, so that's why the capacitance changed. So if the transformer was produced in a factory, and then the initial measurement was done, and we got, let's say, 5 nanofarad, and 5 years later, we, change, we measure again the capacity, the parasitic capacitance, as we called it, and we get not 5, but 7 nanofarad, then we know that there is quite a lot of change inside of our transformer. Actually, it could be insulation, or it could be something else. It could be physical movement which happened inside. But moving on, let us talk about our capacitor. Now, in a capacitor, we all know that current and voltage are shifted in phase by, by 90 degrees, which means actually first you have a current, something flowing in, and then the voltage builds up. And it's always 90 degrees. So the current is leading, leading and the voltage is lagging, as you can see here. That is because the ideal capacitor has no in-phase current, it doesn't have any resistive current, and it doesn't have any resistive current because it's an ideal capacitor. But you might already understand that since there is no such a thing as an ideal capacitor, uh, we will introduce the concept of a real capacitor. And the real capacitor differs from an ideal capacitor by the fact, from, uh, with the fact that there is um, there is not 90 degrees phase shift between current and voltage. It is less than 90 degrees. So later on you will see actually that the tan delta is actually quantifying the difference between ideal and the real capacitor. So what is this ideal, I'm sorry, real capacitor? Well, the real capacitor itself has one resistor connected in parallel. This resistor has a huge resistance. We talk about hundreds of mega ohms, which means that the current flowing through this resistor is very small, in the range of milli ohms or, or micro, uh, sorry, milliamps or microamps, but it's not zero. And if it were zero, then we wouldn't have all this webinar today. We wouldn't have any issues actually with the wouldn't have any issues with the insulation. It would be perfect. But since it's not zero. What happens is that uh, the current running through this resistor creates some issues. So another way how we can explain this is that there is no material on the face of the planet or in the universe which has infinite resistance. Every piece of material, even if it's a dry wood, has a finite resistance. If you take two meters of dry wood, completely dried out, and connect 100 kilovolts on the two sides, there will be a current running through that insulator. It will be a small current, but there will be a current. So there will always be some resistive current going through this resistor. And let us see how we can use that while modeling, and while modeling the insulation. So here we have our real capacitors used on a PCB. And we can say that we are actually searching for the values of insulation's equivalent scheme. So since we can model our uh, insulation as resistance and capacitance connected in parallel, we actually are searching for resistance and capacitance, and tan delta is a physical reality that somehow connects these two elements. So by measuring resistance and capacitance, we measure tan delta. This is also the answer to the question why, when we measure tan delta, we often get a result. As a result, we all also get the capacitance. It is because of this. We also get this result. We might not, let's say, pay too much attention to it, but it is there. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by generating voltage and by measuring the current through the equivalent capacitance and equivalent resistance. We actually cannot measure directly this current and this current. We measure this total current, 
with an ammeter, of course, not like this one, something better. But we do measure the phase shift between the voltage which caused this current and the current which was caused by that voltage. So, of course, we will be more interested in the resistive current. Why? Well, we are more interested in the resistive current because the resistive current is in phase with voltage and the resistive current, if we look at this formula, has cosinus phi 1, which means that the power which is dissipated on our insulation actually is voltage times current. Now let us take one example. Let's say that we have a 10 kilovolt transformer and if we don't, if we have a 10 kilovolt transformer, let's say on the primary side, and only one milliamp of resistive current, so it's one thousandth of an amp, the power which is dissipated is 10 watt. 10 watt per se is not a big power. I mean, light bulbs used to be, and the light bulbs with filaments are between, let's say, 30 and 100 watts. But 10 watt for one hour will dissipate 36,000 joules or 10 watt hours on the insulation of that transformer. Also, if that lasts for the whole day, we will dissipate 240 watt hours in a month, 7.2 kilowatt hours, and in a year, 86.4 kilowatt hours. If we take in the mean value, uh, the mean uh, price of one kilowatt hour, we will lose about 15 euros per year on a small distribution transformer. But it's not the funds, it's not the money which is important here. It is the fact that all this power turns into heat. And that heat is what is problematic. That heat is problematic because the heat has a detrimental effect on the insulation. Let's say if you drive a car, every car has a cooling system. Because as we know, the Carnot process explains that ideally we can maybe transfer about 36% of all the energy which is in one liter of gas, of gasoline, into kinetic energy of a car, into movement of the car. Realistically today, if that is 20%, it is great. But what about the rest 80%? It is heat which, which is generated, and that heat which is generated needs to be removed. Because if it's not removed, then we will have an issue, we will have a too high temperature, and we will not be able to operate our machinery. So if you're not sure if that is, what I'm saying is true, try to break down the cooling system in your car and see how far you will get. So the reason why the resistive current is a problem is that resistive current dissipates a lot of heat and the heat can easily destroy our insulation. It can lead to something like this. And because we don't want something like this happening, what we want to do is we want to keep under control the state of our insulation. So with the heat being applied constantly on the insulator, the insulation starts to degrade and which, as a consequence, has an increase of the resistive current. As the resistive current increases, more heat is dissipated. More heat, in return, additionally degrades the insulation, which now allows more resistive current to flow, and it goes on and on and on, and it's a vicious circle. It's a chain reaction, which, if not stopped at the right moment, will cause something like this. So, hopefully, that will not happen. And let me, actually, let me tell you a story. You see, we talk about insulation today. And one aspect of insulation are also dikes. Not the one on bikes, but the dikes in Netherlands. This is one, one dike in Netherlands, and it is used to insulate the sea from the place where the people live or graze their cattle. You can see that the level of this sea is higher than this level here, so this is a depression, and if this dike were to sprung a leak, it would be an issue. 
So there is this story about a young boy called Hans Brinker. It's a Dutch legend because, as we said, the, the dikes in, in Netherlands are essential to insulate people from the sea. Now, this boy, Hans, was coming back from the visit to his sick grandfather. And while returning, he saw a leak in a dike. All kids, as well as the grown-ups in Netherlands, know that if you see a leaking dike, you should put a plug. You should plug that hole and you should do it fast. And you should do it because if there is the smallest visible leak, nobody knows what's happening inside the dike. You cannot jump inside and see what's happening, but this one small leak can easily create havoc. So imagine like if you have a dam, which is also a type of an insulation. Here you have water, here you don't. But if you... If, the leak would sprung, for example, here, just 5 or 10 centimeter in diameter leak, that leak, it wouldn't take long for that leak to break down the whole, the whole barrier, the whole dam. Because this is a very non-linear process, you see? And because of that, what, what the Hans, in this case, did, he actually plugged that hole with his finger. He plugged that hole good, and he shouted whole night, calling for help. Only in the morning, the priest, who was passing by on his bicycle, saw him, and Hans was exhausted because he was cold, he was shouting all night. So, the priest called the villagers, which relieved Hans of his duty. And that's how he became the boy who saved the village. Now, Tan Delta is not... Hans Brinker. We cannot unfortunately plug the hole, but what we can do with Tan Delta is we can understand how big the hole is, let's say metaphorically. It helps us to understand how functional or how deteriorated is our insulation. So the story does inform us about the non-linear process of the insulation deterioration. Because a small hole, only a few centimeters in diameter, in a dike, can very quickly destroy the whole dike. The same way a small resistive current can cause an insulation deterioration and a short circuit in a power transformer. Because we all know that in a power transformer, all distances are very small and have even smaller margins. Well, another way how to see this is... is Imagine what happened to me, actually, this is a true story. I was in, a, in an exhibition and I saw on one stand a fish tank. It was filled with what I supposed was water, but inside there was a TV set. Inside the fish tank there was a TV set. And the guy who was on the stand was changing the channels and watching the television, which was emerged in an aquarium, which had no fishes, but it had a transparent liquid inside. Well, that transparent liquid inside was mineral oil. And because the mineral oil is an insulator, the TV functioned properly. There was absolutely no problem with insulation and the TV was functioning okay. But now imagine that you have this situation back home and every day you put one drop of water inside that tank and then you stir it up. After 5 or 10 days, probably nothing would happen. Maybe nothing would happen after 50 days. But if for 100 consecutive days, you would be putting one drop of water inside and stirring, at one point in time, what would happen is that there would be enough water inside that mineral oil to cause a short circuit. And that's what happens. That is what happens inside of your power transformer. You have a transformer which breathes, We'll talk about that later. That transformer attracts water molecules inside and the water molecules sooner or later can create a short circuit. So what we do here with Tan Delta, we will measure and tell you when is the high time to get your TV out. And finally, to answer the question why we test Tan Delta, we test on delta because we want to know the state of our insulation or we want to know how far are we from the insulation breaking. 
And since insulation has a very non-linear characteristic, a very small increase in resistive current can suddenly make the insulation break. So, also it's important to emphasize that the high value of tan delta, not too high, and later you will find out what is high, is not necessarily a sign that we need to change the asset. Often what we need to do is simply to follow the trend. And by following the trend, we will also know do we need to change that asset or not. So, another way to answer the question why we do a tan delta test, we do a tan delta test to keep our asset running. And with this, <coughs> excuse me, we finished the first part. Now, in the second part, we will be doing something else. We will be actually talking about the theory and the practice of tan delta testing. So, this was just a short introduction. Well, it was 30 minute introduction, but I hope I managed to explain to you the idea behind tan delta. Now, we know why we measure tan delta, and here you can see PF. It is an abbreviation for power factor. You will, I will explain later exactly what does it mean, but let me say that um, we will also talk about some other names for tan delta. You will see that another name for tan delta is dissipation factor, while the concept of power factor is being used in some other countries, for example, USA, etc., etc. So, let us start now looking at the voltage and current vectors in an insulation. In an ideal insulator, which, uh, I'm sorry, in an ideal capacitor, we have an ideal insulator. We have 90 degrees shift between current and voltage. So, this is the voltage which we apply, and this is the current which is caused by that voltage. By the way, Tan delta test is an offline test. I didn't mention it before, but you cannot do a tan delta test while the asset is being used. What you can do, if you want to continuously measure tan delta, you can install sensors, and then you will have an online monitoring of tan delta, which is different. I mean, again, you are measuring the same thing, but today we're talking about offline testing. So that means my testing equipment will apply a voltage and then it will measure current and this is one of the testing equipment which we use later you will see some other this would be an STS 5000 and this would be the TD 5000 which will apply up to 12 kilovolts but we know that we are not dealing with a perfect uh, or ideal insulation or a capacitor we are dealing with a real insulation and we learned just a few minutes ago, that a real insulation or a real capacitor has uh, a resistive current which is passing through this resistor here, which means that the total current is the vectorial sum of IC and IR. So what we can say is that uh, the total current is the sum of charging component and the loss component. And we have to say that the charging component is much, much bigger than the resistive component, but the resistive component, as we said before, is not zero. And this is how you would draw this in Cartesian system. You would have an IC here and IR here. Now, I would like to draw one thing for you. Of course, in this case, we made IR very big, just for the sake of, let's say, correct definition. But uh, what I would say here is important to say is that, as we, as we mentioned before, IR is very, very small. So it would be more like maybe this big. So if you would sum up this vector here and this vector here, you wouldn't get something like this. You would more, more or less get something like, like this, something which is very close to the y-axis. So this would be our total current. And just to give you a heads up, you see this small angle here? This small angle would be your delta. And you will see that just a small angle delta might wreak havoc on your primary equipment. So let us finally define what is a tan delta.
tan delta is the ratio of in-phase or resistive current to a 90 degree or capacitive current. And we can see tan delta is IR over IC. If we play a little bit with the formula here, we can also see that tan delta is a reciprocal value of omega RC. This is a constant number. If we are doing a test in a European country, this would be 314. And if we do that test where the nominal frequency is 60, it's slightly higher. But anyway, you could see that the resistance and the capacitance with which we model the insulation are needed to calculate tan delta. So tan delta is the tangents of this angle here. And this angle is usually very, very small. For power transformers, one degree, you are already in trouble. You will, I will show you later what is the limit, but usually this is a very small angle. Another name for tan delta is dissipation factor. And dissipation factor has um, been used in some other countries. So let's say in some countries they say, I'm measuring C and DF instead of I'm measuring tan delta. Uh, and then there are some countries like USA, which use the term power factor. Now, actually, tan delta and power factor are very, very similar. They're very similar because, um, you see, tan delta is resistive current over capacitive current, while power factor is resistive current over total current. And since we said that this angle is very small, let's say this would be your total current, whether I'm dividing this length with this length here, I see, or this length with this length here, the yellow line, it wouldn't make much difference. So one could say also that power factor is cosinus phi, while phi would be this angle here, or IR divided with I total. And of course, there are formulas which can convert one into the other. So this one and this one. And you see, we will say very soon what are the expected values. But let me give you a preview and say that these numbers are very small. Actually, they're very close to, let's say, 0.001 or 0.1. So if you factor that in while looking at this particular formula, you will understand that power factor and tan delta are the same. Actually, for the values of delta, of this angle here, up to 10 degrees, power factor and tan delta can be considered the same value. And one could say that tan delta, and if tan delta and power factor are different, then the insulation is already compromised due to the fact that the angle is too high. So if you have already more than 10 degrees, if your, if your delta is more than 10 degrees, we already have too much resistive current, which will in turn then uh, destroy our insulation. But how does the insulation actually get compromised? Well, what happens is that the insulation gets older. It gets old. All of us, we get old. And all of us, including the transformers, breathe. We said before that the transformer breathes. So for those of you who know, just bear with me. And for those of you who don't know, imagine a situation of a 250 MVA transformer, which is a big transmission transformer, which is supplying a city of 100,000 people. During the day, the temperature outside is 30 degrees Celsius or 25 degrees Celsius. And the transformer is being used to power air conditions, and people's lives. People are awake during the day. The transformer is maybe used at 70 or 80 percent of nominal power. And inside the transformer, the oil increases its volume. And as the oil increases its volume, it's simply bigger. But then the night comes, the temperature drops, people go to sleep, and the transformer is not used anymore 80%, but maybe 20 or 30% of its nominal power. And since the temperature reduces, the oil reduces its volume. 
Then again, the morning comes, the oil increases the volume, the night comes, it decreases the volume. So I hope you follow me and you understand that this is a definition of breathing. The same thing when you breathe. If you want to breathe in, you will expand your lungs, your, your chest, in order to suck the air inside. And then you will contract it to push it outside. The same is done with the transformer. And that's why transformer has a breather. The breather is that pipe through which the transformer breathes. At the beginning of that pipe, you have some silicon, which is put there for a reason, which is to remove all the water molecules from the air. And it does a good job. You, need, you know that you need to change that breather when it changes color. Sometimes from blue to white, sometimes there are some other colors. But the point is that even though you have the breather, it is not perfect. Like ideal transformer, it doesn't exist. There will always be some water molecules which enter the transformer. And these water molecules contribute to the conductivity of the insulator, of the oil. And also, these water molecules usually inhibit, uh, they stay in the cellulose. I would say 90 to 99% of all the water which is in your transformer is actually in the cellulose, in the paper and the press board. It is not in the oil. Another reason how our insulation is uh, compromised, gets compromised is, let's say, partial discharge. So partial discharge inside the transformer is um, a process where we have small sparks, let's say between the high voltage and the low voltage, or maybe two windings, etc., etc. And in this process, the gases are developed. And unfortunately, the gases also increase the conductivity of our insulating system, which is a problem. Also, we have oxidation process, which creates a sludge, which also reduces the insulating properties and increases the conductivity. Acidity changes, and all this contribute to the deterioration of insulation. And let me give you some numbers now. How do we know that the result is good? How do we know that we measured a good value for tan delta? Well, I would say that this, what you see right here, which we will discuss right now, is uh, also standard, but it is not the only standard. So this is an IEEE standard, and for a new transformer, in general, the tan delta or dissipation factor should be less than 0.5. Then, if the number is between 0.5 and 1 for a service stage transformer, then we talk about uh, also good insulation, acceptable insulation, and only if tan delta is bigger than 1%, only in that case we have the right to suspect that there is some that there are some problems happening inside. So what I'm saying here is that maybe you have noticed that all of a sudden I, I've started using percentages. Well, I'm using percentages simply because when you do a tan delta, when you measure a tan delta, you see you have two values which are uh, both amps. So you get a, a number which has no dimension. But that number is usually 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 or 0 0.005. So instead of saying 000, you just multiply that number with 100 and then you slap the percentage sign onto it and then you express yourself in percentage. So long story short, tan delta should be less than 1%. So this is what we talk about when we talk about transformers. But in preparation for this webinar, I have went through some articles and um, there was an interesting article. This is an article which was uh, made by Mr. Rajani Menon and his collaborators. Um, here, you actually have four, mm, let's say, categories. We talk about extra high voltage transformers, and then, let's say, medium voltage transformers. And then again, we, we have some high voltage transformers. And then we have some standard distribution transformers. So why have we done this? Why, why have they done this? Because it is not always the same whether you have a weak insulation at 400 kilovolts or a weak insulation at 10 kilovolts. 
Of course, if you have a weak insulation at 400 kilovolts, it's a bigger risk than having a weak insulation at 10 kilovolts. So we could say that there are different values for a transformer tan delta values for, uh, for these transformers. So for example, what you can see here is that uh, the values for extra high voltage go from 02 to 09. And I want to turn your attention to one more thing. You see that here we don't talk about only one number. We have three values which we will be talking about. Because we have an insulation between high voltage and low voltage. We have insulation between uh, high voltage and tank and low voltage and tank. And you will see later what I mean by this. So for now, what we can see, uh, what we can see is that for extra high voltage, the, the insulation between high and low voltage side, the insulation should be very good between 0, 0.2 and 0, 0.5, which is much less than 1%. High voltage versus tank is between 0, 0.7 and 0, 0.9, if it's smaller, even better, and low voltage tank is between 0, 0.4 and 0, 0.8. And also we have some capacitances here. Now, a capacitance is really difficult to assess, uh, I mean, it's not difficult to assess, it's difficult to say what would be the nominal values because it depends heavily on the construction, on the design of the transformer, on some of the materials which are being used. But these are some, I would say, guidelines when we talk about capacitance. And capacitance for a power transformer are expressed in nanofarad and capacitance for bushings are mostly expressed in hundreds of picofarad. Now, when we talk about, let's say, medium voltage transformer, then we see that high voltage, low voltage, tan delta is between 0, 0.3 and 0, 0.6, but high voltage tank and low voltage tank can go up to 1%. Then, I would say a standard high voltage transformer, 132 to 11, would be between 0, 0.3 and 0, 0.6 for high voltage and low voltage, and between high voltage and tank and low voltage and tank, you could have a little bit more margin. And then last but not least, would be a distribution transformer, in that case, since we don't have a very high voltage levels here, the tan delta can also be higher, even up to 2%. But what you need to observe is that high voltage, low voltage is always the one which needs to be the smallest. The tan delta for these insulation needs to be the strongest because this is, let's say, the important one. Now, I hope this, this part is clear you are encouraged to ask questions. So Sirtel asked, is there some standard about tan delta level for high voltage transformers? So I hope this is answered by, by this slide here. And another thing I want to answer is, I haven't mentioned before that all these values are at 20 degrees Celsius. Tan delta depends on temperature. It's temperature dependent. And we can see here what is the temperature, what is the formula, how to recalculate tan delta onto 20 degrees Celsius. You see, if tan delta at 20 degrees Celsius is 1, it is the same like having tan delta of 3 at 70 degrees Celsius. So what you need to find out is what is the temperature of the oil on your transformer. You simply read it from the gauge which is installed on the transformer and you factor that in after you measure the tan delta. Because if it's 50 degrees outside and you guys got, let's say, 1.8, it doesn't mean that your high voltage transformer has a problem. It simply means that you need to compensate for that temperature using this formula here. So I hope that that is clear. Now, moving on, how to interpret results. Uh, also, I'm having some questions about negative values of tan delta in a transformer, so let me address that right away. There are a few reasons why you could get a negative value for the tan delta. One of them is you are not performing the test properly. This is very often the reason. It's a sign that you didn't connect something correctly. Another reason could also be that the grounding of your substation is not done properly, because then you are also not able to properly uh, assess, uh, to properly measure tan delta. Grounding is essential because we, we measure also the current going through the ground. And one thing which uh, Mr. Simone Menegin mentioned, because we did have that same question, 
in the morning uh, session is you need to understand uh, what is the value of tan delta, of this negative tan delta. Are we talking about minus 7% or minus 0.01%? Because if you have minus 7 or 3 or 1.5%, probably you have issues with the execution of measurement. You are not measuring correctly. But if you have minus 0.01, in that case, uh, you are probably dealing with a very good insulation and the accuracy of the measurement is maybe not that great. So while measuring the current and while calculating tan delta, there might have been some errors which happen while calculating tan delta. So uh, the tan delta, negative tan delta, it means that this vector here, it means that this total vector is not 90 but more than 90 degrees. And this can happen sometimes. Not, it is not a physical reality, it is actually a problem with the measurement. In your case, what I would do if I had a situation like that, I would repeat the measurement and before that I would check thoroughly if all the connectors are connected properly and if we are doing the test correctly. Later I will show you some tips and tricks how you can make sure that you are doing a good measurement. So let me also read the next question. How to follow tan delta according to trend recording? Because one of the side, slides stated that the evaluation is not only about comparing to a specific value. So that's a good question and thank you for that. So one could say that if you measure tan delta on a yearly basis, that absolute maximum of delta of change which can happen is 0.1%. Again, it's not written in stone. The new I would say standard is being written and it, this will be included but if you have a new transformer which has tan delta of 0.3 and after five years you measure that transformer and the tan delta is 0.9 which is still below one that's a sign for an alarm so let's say that the rule of thumb would be 0.1 percent per year or less and we have one more um, one more question. Please discuss how ISA tan delta measure technique and results compare with double and Omicron technique. So the results are comparable. Actually, they are the same. I had an experience. I measured in few laboratories with our device TDX and with double device M4100 and we got the same results. Sometimes they would be the same up to a third or fourth decimal. Sometimes the second decimal would be different. But effectively, the differences are very, very small or there are no differences whatsoever. So it's completely normal to use an ISA test set, for example, after you have used a Doble or an Omicron test set. So um, I hope that answers your question. Now, moving on. And we'll return to the rest of the questions a little bit later. How do we evaluate results? So first, as we said, we compare to the previous values. This is the best way how to assess your tan delta value or your power factor value. Because your transformer, when it came from the factory, was probably tested for tan delta in the factory. So you do have that information somewhere. If you can dig out that information and bring it to the test site, you will see what was the tan delta when the transformer was uh, produced and what is the tan delta today, which is something which can definitely tell you if you have an issue or not. Also, as we mentioned before, the change should not exceed 0.1% per year or less. The next way how to evaluate results is comparison to allowed values. So if you have, if you use the table, which we have shown before, like this one, you compare it and the number needs to be smaller than one as a general rule. Or if you want to be more exact, you can take a look at this table and then compare it to that. The third way would be comparison of the phases. If you are measuring tan delta on bushings, because you will see later that we don't just measure tan delta on, uh, we don't just measure tan delta on the body of the transformer, we also measure it on the bushings of the transformer. Uh, if you measure on three phases, A, B and C, 
you expect to get the same numbers, especially if the bushings are the same, installed at the same time and from the same producer. If a certain bushing has a higher ton delta, then what you will probably do is frequency sweep. But we will talk about that in our next session. And then, of course, if you cannot do any of these steps, sometimes you will have the same type of transformer. Let's say you will have a substation and two or three transformers from the same producer, same type, installed same age, and then you will measure one and then the other, and then you can compare between them the values. So this is also one way how to check if your results are good. Now, let us discuss what is the nominal value at which you should measure tan delta. What is the actual value of voltage which should be applied when measuring tan delta? First of all, it is not necessary and in many cases not possible to generate less to, to generate more than 12 kilovolts. Why is this so? It's so because at 12 kilovolts, all the polarization processes inside of your insulation are done. Even if you would generate 200 kilovolts instead of 12 kilovolts, you wouldn't get a different result. So, first of all, 12 is, or very often people uh, use 10, volt, 10 kilovolts, but 12 is, let's say, the prescribed value. And of course, you need to keep in mind what is the voltage level of your transformer. If you have 10 to 0, 4 and you are generating on the low voltage side, you cannot generate more than the nominal voltage. So please be aware of that. Also, what is the testing frequency? The testing frequency can be, uh, should be as close as possible to nominal. So 60 hertz or 50 hertz. Now, there are some differences when it comes to measurement, uh, the voltage, and frequency and that mostly concerns rotary machines so mostly generators generators sometimes can be tested with up to 15 volts kilovolts so 1.5 if necessary and in that case you might change the frequency a little bit more in the case of transformers you shouldn't change the frequency more than let's say 2 hertz so this is about frequency and about voltage so here we have some of our test sets so let me look at some questions which just came in Negative PF is a reality in bushings with internal tracking. PF will be negative, yes. Uh, also, tan delta is uh, 1 over omega I RC as per equation. In this case, which is the ideal frequency for measuring the same? So I hope we just answered that. So the frequency should always be the nominal frequency. Is there a shield between high voltage and low voltage winding? It will result in a negative, uh, negative value. I have to say I'm not sure if this is so, but uh, if... You could send me some uh, ideas, some, uh, let's say, your own experiences to my email. I would be very uh, happy. And we will look into that. The applied voltage must always be sinusoidal. Yes, the applied voltage is always a sine wave. Can tan delta uh, depend on measurement frequency? Yes, it does depend on measurement frequency, and uh, but it, not so much. Let me just say that we will talk next time about frequency sweep. This is when we do tan delta at different frequency levels. It depends on the frequency, but not very much. If it starts to depend very much on the frequency, then we have a problem with the insulation. And why is it considered tan delta uh, value more than 1% for distribution transformer? That means resistive current is more to produce heat dissipation. Well, as I said, these numbers are not written in stone for a, for, for a transformer, a distribution transformer, which has a lower voltage, let's say lower than 60 kilovolt or, or even lower than 11 kilovolt, you can go up to 2%. And yes, it is more resistive current, but the point is that we don't have a very big voltage. And since we don't have a very big voltage, the insulation doesn't have to withstand such, let's say, high pressures or let's say high differences of potential. So for higher voltages or extra high voltage, you should have lower values of tan delta or a better insulation. It's like if you have two pipes through which the water flows, and let's say that they're the same pipes, and both of them have a small leak, not a leak, a small hole, very small hole. If you have pressure of one bar in, in pipe number one and a pressure of 100 bar in another pipe, then the small hole in the second pipe would be more detrimental. I mean, it would be more of a risk to the system than if you would have that same hole in 
the pipe which would have only one or two bar. So I hope that answers your question. Please explain why it should be sinusoidal. Well, honestly, it's how the standard prescribes it, and I can just explain it in this way, because sine sinusoidal voltage is what is used. So the best way how to test an asset is if you use your nominal uh, voltage and nominal current, which then replicate the whole situation, how the asset is being used. For the temperature correction factor, is it dependent on the oil condition, how old it is? No, the temperature uh, correction factors are always the same. Um, temperature correction factor K is the presentation referred to which standard? It's an IEEE standard. Uh, I will tell you later what was the exact number. Um, doesn't absorption current affect the results? Mm, I'm not sure I understand that. Please, can you just send me if you can explain a little bit what you mean by that absorption current. Um, what is the maximum testing voltage of low voltage transformer? Uh, so, on the primary side, you would generate 10 kilovolt, and on the secondary, you would generate 0.4 kilovolt. And you will see that now. Is there any chance of deferring the capacitance and tan delta measured with high and low and low and high? They're absolutely the same. So whether you measure it from the high, high voltage side or the low voltage side, the number should be the same. Uh, is ESA building a library of test values for various transformer models and bushing models to offer as a test guide? Well, we didn't do that because in the last seven years, actually, we were mostly being guided by the 1% value. And for a bigger transformer, that value, uh, you see, for the bigger transformer, what usually happens is that people who are using those transformers, the asset managers, have the initial values. And we do compare with the initial values. That's what helps us understand what is, what is uh, a better, what is actually expected from us. But I'm not saying that it will not happen in the future. So let's continue. If we want to do all the steps. So... On which assets can we measure tan delta? Tan delta we can measure on a power transformer, on a body and the bushing of a power transformer, instrument transformer and the protection transformer, so CTs and VTs, on a generator doing a tip-up test and on a motor doing a tip-down test. So tip-up test is what we call a voltage sweep. Next time we will look into that, but the voltage sweep is when you do a tan delta test or a power factor test on different voltage levels. So, let's say uh, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100% of nominal value. And then you go 80, 60, 40, 20, and you compare those results to see if they are the same. And you, you do the same thing with, with a motor. On a cable, also, on a cable, you can test a power factor or a tan delta. And generally, on a cable, you will have much lower values. So, again, uh, to, to discern the values which we're talking about, these are the values for a transformer. If we were to talk about cables, then these numbers would be much smaller. And if we were to talk about generators, then these numbers would be much bigger. So for a generator, between 3 and 5%, that's a good value of a tan delta for a transformer. Now, we can also measure them on surge arresters. And as I said, we can measure them on any a primary equipment which has an insulation. Now, um, I have another question here. There are some brands that run tan delta tests with frequency sweep. Is there a standard that validates this method? As much as I know, uh, I didn't find any real standard, uh, but I will dig a little bit deeper. And next time when we will be talking about the sweeps on Monday, I hope I will have an answer for you. So, right now, let us see what is the correct procedure when performing a tan delta on a power transformer. Um, now, the first thing you need to do is when you're doing a tan delta test is to remove that power transformer from the network. You, you simply open the circuit breaker, you open the disconnectors so that you are the one who is generating voltage and current. The next step is usually prescribed by all the utilities. Sometimes people forget to execute that step, and if that step is not executed, 
therein lies the risk of damaging the testing equipment. So the thing is that you should take your grounding rod and you should touch all phases of primary, secondary, and if you have tertiary side with the grounding rod, thus de-energizing fully the transformer. So transformer needs to be fully de-energized because if it's not, excuse me, what might happen is that some remaining current or voltage can close itself through the measurement of tan delta device. And this is something which can then damage the testing equipment. The third step is short circuit. This is very important. We should short circuit fully the primary side, phases ABC, secondary side separately, ABC, and if you have also the tertiary side. You should do that, you will see why, and when you do that, you should also correctly ground your testing equipment. Correctly ground, it means that you ground the testing equipment in the same grounding point where your transformer is grounded. So that means that you shouldn't have two different points of grounding, otherwise the current would, can close in a different loop and you might get bad results. If you are now testing, the next step would be if you have STS and TD, so this would be STS and TD, before you turn them on, you would connect them and these two uh, boxes, and then you would turn them on, don't connect them while they are on. And if you have a TDX, since it's a one box solution, you don't have to do any connections. So this is showing you actually how the short circuit is done on the primary side, how the short circuit is done on the secondary side. And for this example, we are taking a transformer which has primary and secondary side. And as you do this, what you actually create, you create a situation where you have as we spoke before, three capacitors. You have capacitance between the high voltage and the low voltage. You have the capacitance between the high voltage and ground and low voltage and ground. And standardized, let's say, names are CHL, high voltage, low voltage, CH and CL. You can see that that's how this table was made. This is CHL, this is CH and this is CL. Why is this so? Well, this is a good thing. Because when you do a tan delta measurement, you don't just get one number. You get minimum three numbers. And it's good because maybe all of them are okay, but maybe CHL is good and CH is good, but CL is bad. Which means the insulation between the low voltage and the ground is not good. So you have some indication what needs to be fixed. When you do some other DC test, you just get one number. And that one number cannot tell you where the problem lies. Here you get minimum three numbers and effectively you will get nine numbers because or even maybe uh, 11 because you will also be testing each bushing for it for itself. So after you have short circuited you need to connect the cables. So our first step in this case will be uh, simply to generate first on the high voltage side and measure from the low voltage side. And just to remind you, this is the equivalent scheme of a two winding transformer because we have short circuited all phases. We didn't short circuit primary together with secondary, we short circuited separately primary and se separately secondary. And also the neutral is also taken into consideration when we did the short circuit. And you can do this with a thin wire because the current flowing will be milliamps. So you don't need to use thick wires. Of course you can, but it's not necessary. With this setup, as you can see, generation on the high voltage winding and measurement on the low voltage winding, you can measure CHL, which is this one, and you can measure CH. Using this setup, you cannot measure CL. To measure CL, we'll do something else. Now, as you have connected and grounded properly your system, you need to punch in the nominal values. It's a good idea to say, well, it's necessary to say whether you have a three-phase or single-phase transformer and whether you have a two-three winding transformer or auto or auto transformer with tertiary. That's something we that depends on what type of transformer do you test. But what you can see is that it's also a good idea to write 
what are the nominal values of your tan delta and capacitance because then you can get an automatic uh, assessment whether your result is good or bad, or so pass or fail. And then what you guys do, you need to go into the application and this is now the good part. In our application, when you click this drop menu, you should say this is the answer to the question where have I connected the high voltage generation coming from my test set. I can connect it to a high voltage winding or to a low voltage winding. Or if I have a transformer which has also a tertiary, it can also be connected to the tertiary. So right now I have connected to the high voltage winding and then I answer the question what do I want to measure? CHL which is this or I can measure CH or I can also measure CH plus CHL in one shot. So these are three things which I can measure with my voltage, uh, with this setup. And then if you're not sure how to connect, of course, you just press the question mark button and you will get this nice, nice scheme. And also what I wanted to say is that as you have chosen this and this, automatically the system chose what method will be used. Will it be a UST or a GST method? This is a topic for our next discussion. UST means ungrounded specimen test and GST means a grounded specimen test. So just as a preview, I'll tell you that if you want to measure CHL, you will use a UST because this specimen, this part of insulation is not grounded on any side, while this specimen is grounded and also this specimen is grounded on one side. So you can see that when I choose a CHL, a UST A method is chosen. You choose the voltage, which is the maximum voltage which you can choose for your transformer or 12 kilovolts, or 10 is also often used, frequency, and then you also choose a single test. This would be voltage sweep and this would be a frequency sweep. Here you would see your nominal values and here you can also do a temperature compensation. Now, after doing that, you would position correctly the cursor, add test, and you would make sure that nobody is close to the power transformer. Dear friends, safety is of the utmost importance when doing this test because 10 kilovolts or 12 kilovolts or even 1 kilovolt is more than enough to, to damage let's say, or, or to hurt a human being. So be mindful when executing this test. As you press start, you would observe the lower left corner and you would see when the test is executed. First, you would have the stage of load evaluation, then calibration, and then measurement. And actually, we're doing two measurements and I will explain next time why. And when the test is done, you would go back to this uh, screen and you would just drop this menu again and you would choose CH. By choosing CH you would again make sure that nobody is close, press start and you would check the results. Then you would press the emergency button. The emergency button is a very nice mushroom type red button which is this one here. We also have it here and this button is important because you see of course, nobody is going to intentionally press start when somebody is on the transformer, but nobody knows if something like that will happen accidentally. So, because we are very, let's say, uh, we care about your safety, we, we want you to use the emergency button. Now, as you have pressed the emergency button, you will make a switch. Now, the high voltage generation will go to the low voltage side of the power transformer and the measurement will be coming from your high voltage side. You would configure, so I'm sorry, this would be your connection. Now the measurement would be going here. This is called input A and this is input B, for example. That's why we had here UST A. A means that the measurement was coming to input A. And now in this setup, you would be generating voltage here, maximum allowed voltage, or 10 or 12, and you would be measuring from here. And in this setup, you can measure CL, but you can also measure CHL. 
So this is one of the ways how you can verify if you're doing a good measurement. You can measure CHL from the high voltage side, then you can repeat that measurement from the low voltage side, and you can see if the number is the same. Up to a third or a fourth decimal, it should be the same. Another way how you can make sure that you are testing correctly is you can measure CL, then you can measure CHL, and then only with one shot you can measure the sum of CL plus CHL. And what you can do, what, what that gives you is the fact that if you sum up this capacitance and this capacitance and you get the same number like when you measure the sum, it means that you are performing the test correctly. So this is one of the ways to make sure you're doing everything correctly. It's not that this is necessary, but this is, I'm giving you some tips and tricks. I'm giving you some tips and tricks in order simply to, um, to be sure that you are doing the test correctly in case there are some issues. In the past, there were some, uh, the, the tan delta measurement was pretty difficult because uh, we were not measuring, uh, let's say that we needed to measure very small values like today, but analog uh, circuitry would, was more prone to the noise. Today, we're not facing such issues, but regardless, it is something which should be taken into consideration. And now, after connecting the generation to the low voltage side, we choose what we want to measure. So as you can see, you can measure CL or CHL. So CL would be insulation between the low voltage winding and the ground. Again, CHL would be the insulation, the state of the insulation between high voltage and the ground. And CL plus CHL is here just to check if the measurement was okay. Automatically, the device would choose the appropriate method and the test would be ready to start. So again, the process is you press start, you look at the bottom left corner and you check the result. You press the emergency button as you approach, before you approach the PT, and then you start the next set of measurement. And before you do that, you remove the short circuit. You remove the short circuit because the next step is measuring the bushings. Now bushings are actually more prone to insulation issues. And very often, you sometimes actually you just measure the bushings for tan delta. Maybe you don't even measure the body for tan delta, but you measure the body for tan delta every two to five years, and bushings maybe every year. If you want to measure the bushing, in that case, there is a test plug here, and this test plug needs to be unscrewed, and then you, you would connect first measurement and later generation here. And then there are three, there are two values you measure on each bushing, C1 and C2. Also, on this nameplate, you would see C1 and C2 written. And as my colleague Simone mentioned in the morning, these numbers are the numbers of the tan delta of the bushing, which was measured in the factory. These numbers can sometimes differ because in the factory, it was not mounted on this particular transformer. So that's why these numbers can be slightly different. And if you do not have this test plug, a tap, then you can use something which we call the hot collar. It, is, it looks like a collar, it looks like, like a belt, like a strap. The first thing you need to do is to clean very well your bushing. And after cleaning the bushing, you should tighten it very nicely. The uh, gray side should go on the inside, the green part on the outside. And then you would use this as your connector to measure or to generate voltage or to measure current. So this would be the scheme. You would, in order to measure C1, you would generate here and measure here. And in order to measure C2, you would generate here and measure here. So you would just shift this like before. So long story short, uh, you measure all three bushings. And when you measure C2, please be careful so that you do not generate more than one kilovolt. In some cases, you can even go up to two kilovolts, but you don't need such a high number and you are risking to damage insulation or to, to damage uh, the transformer if you generate a voltage which is more than one to two kilovolts while generating on C2. So you would be measuring C1 and C2. You would be doing that for all the phases. And then 
you would be repeating that if you have that chance on the secondary side on the, of the transformer. And then you would move on to the next power transformer. When you would finish, you would get these results. CH, capacitance between the high voltage winding and the ground, and the tan delta of that insulation. CL, so capacitance low voltage winding in the ground, and CHL, capacitance between the high voltage and low voltage winding. So this is what you would get. This is the body. And then you would get C1 and C2 for phase A on the high voltage side, C1 and C2 for phase B, and the one for phase C. And if you have also, the, if you measure the low voltage side, you would get the same set of information. And long story short, the easiest way to interpret results is that all of them should be less than 1%, all tan delta. Capacitance, there is no standard for the capacitance. The only thing is that you, you should have the previous values. And if that value changes more than 7%, this is, again, a value I heard a few years ago, but I haven't found that in any standard, but it was more of an empirical value. If the capacitance changes more than 7%, that's a sign for the alarm. If you have some tan delta, which are more than 1%, you would do a sweep to get a better view of what's happened. And uh, we are almost done. So what I would like to mention here is, and allow me to read this, let us keep in mind that when we measure tan delta values of a complex insulation, so oil, press board, paper, we will know the state of the whole insulation, not just one segment. So we will not just know the state of the oil, or just the state of the paper, or just the state of the press board which is a big advantage in respect to, for example, dielectric breakdown test of the oil, which that test also has its place, but you can have a perfect oil, but since most of the water molecules are in the cellulose, in the paper and press board, it doesn't help you if you have a fully functioning oil and, and the damaged insulation uh, in the cellulose. So, you know, so what I'm trying to say here is that tan delta gives you a bigger picture not just picture of one segment. So, because if we just test the oil, as I said, we will know the state of the oil, but we will know if it's conductive or not, and how conductive is it, but if we get good results for the oil and the paper is full of water, then we're missing the big picture. And as we mentioned before, most of water stays, even up to 95 or even 99%, stays in the hydroscopic, stay, I'm sorry, stays in the paper and the press board. So we have now one example and actually four more slides and then we're done. This is an example of one test which we did in Russia. So it was in a city of Kazan. It was not a small transformer. It was about, if I'm not mistaken, 45 MVA transformer. This is the report, but what I wanted to show you is where after you've done your measurement, for example, we measured CH we measured CHL, and we measured CHT. So this was a transformer with primary, secondary, and tertiary winding. You could see that here we have the values for the CHL. I'm sorry, for the CH. So this is the insulation between the high voltage winding and the ground. And you can see here that we wanted to generate 10 kilovolts and 50 hertz. We actually, the device generated 9,994.4, so this is quite accurate. The total current which was going out, capacitive plus resistive, was about 12.85 milliamps. With our device, you can generate up to 300 milliamps. And the capacitance between the high voltage and the ground was 4.0976 nanofarad. The tan delta is the number we're looking for. And we have here 0 0.2283, which is more than a good result since it's less than 1%. And you can see that the power factor is the same as tan delta. That, and that's what we mentioned before. Up to 10 degrees, they're almost the same. And even up to, up to 5 degrees, they're the same up to, I think, even the third decimal. So moving on, we also have this RP. So we will see that on the next slide. RP is 342.7 megaohms. So actually, when we measured, when we executed this measurement, we measured the capacitance of 4.097 nanofarad, 
and we measured the resistance of 342 mega ohms. So we have these two values, and if you take these two numbers and use the formula for tan delta, which is equal to 1 divided with omega rc, you would get 0 0.22, uh, let me check, 0 0.2283 of tan delta. Uh, also, one thing which I like to mention is that here you have the angle phi. So just to remind you, the angle phi is not the angle delta. Angle phi is this angle here. So it's this angle here. This angle should normally be 90. In this case, it is not 90, but it's 89.89.8692. So it's only 0 0.13 degrees, 0 0.13 degrees less than ideal. And this gives us the tan delta of 0.2283%. So let me just tell you that if your delta would be 0.52 degrees, or let me put it like this, if your phi would be uh, smaller than 89.42, you would have a tan delta bigger than 1. This just goes to prove how small that angle is allowed to be. Or if we talk about Hans Brinker and the story about uh, the dike, how small the leak can be to destroy the whole dike. And just to close the whole story, to explain what is the QF or quality factor, QF is nothing but a reciprocal value of a tan delta in absolute terms, so not multiplied by 100, and this number needs to be bigger than 100. If it's smaller, then the tan delta is bigger than 1%. And here we also have Rs. Rs can also be calculated as tan delta divided with 2 omega c, which actually tells us that if you have uh, an equivalent scheme, which is not the connection of capacitive of capacitance and resistance in parallel, but capacitance and resistance in series, this is what would be the resistance connected in series. And with this, we close the presentation. And before I start reading the questions, let me thank you for your attention. So I'm reading the question now. Um, there are some brands that can run tan delta tests with frequency sweep. Is there a standard that well? Okay, we we've read this. Let me then go back because I see that you have had a bit of a chat. Uh, ta, 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 ta. One, two, three. What is the difference between the tip up and the tip down test? Tip up is increasing the voltage. Tip down is decreasing the voltage. What is the maximum capacitance to which 12 kV, kV can be connected from ESA kit? So the maximum capacitance is a little bit less than 100 nanofarad. So between 1995 to 100 nanofarad is the maximum capacitance. We saw before that these capacitances are much less than that, even if you sum them up. So let me check. Here we see that the capacitance is the biggest one is, let's say, 24. So if you sum up this, this, and this, you would still be far away from 90 degrees. So even if you have a transformer with primary, secondary, and tertiary value. The next would be, if 12 kV is the voltage with which the test is done because the insulation is polarized, is there any chance to perform the test on a low voltage side? On a low voltage side... Uh, in transformers where the secondary side is less than 10 kV. So, well, when I say 12 kV, I'm saying that 12 kV on a transformer which has a nominal voltage less, uh, more than 12. Of course, if you have 10 kilovolts, you will do a test at 10 kilovolts. And actually, very often people do a test at 10 kilovolts. Uh, Ibrahim is asking how can we measure the tan delta for gas air bushing, which doesn't have a test tab. We we had a lot of questions about this, and uh, please allow me a few days to look into that. We had some also discussion about it in the morning, and actually I haven't had a chance to do something like that. There is a problem with that system because you cannot physically approach it, but uh, you could maybe measure from some point further away from the tap, from the bushing, and then 
get an idea of what is the insulation of not just the bushing but also the part where where you are connected what is the maximum capacitance measured using ESA kit as we said it's about 90 uh, between 90 and 100 nano nanofarad but also let me tell you that uh, this test set can also be used to measure tan delta on cables the cables have this let's say issue in which the capacitance is much much bigger and uh, if you were to have a cable which is a medium voltage cable up to 20 kilovolts and with a standard of 0 0.36 um, farads per kilometer you would be able to measure up to even maybe even 3.6 kilometers this is a quick uh, let's say a, a quick calculation but for sure it your answer depends uh, i mean your, how big cable can you test depends on what is the voltage level of the cable and what is the capacitance per kilometer in some cases if you purchase a re reactor which is just the additional inductor in that case you would be able to extend that so one user is saying IEEE C57161 2018 dielectric frequency response but this is an answer but it but it for a sweep for a tan delta from one yes this is this is a norm for a tan delta for a very very low values of frequency and with this method you are actually testing the paper the cellulose which usually as we said contains most of the water could you please explain length dependency on tan delta on high voltage power cable? So I think we just covered that, but just in short, it depends very much what is your capacitance per hundred uh, per kilometer. So if I can measure, let's say with 12 kilovolts, uh, let's say 100 nanofarad, if you have the capacitance of 100 nanofarad per kilometer, you could measure one kilometer. So feel free to send me a mail on my email and uh, if you have some stand if you have some uh, cables and you know what are their capacitances we would be able to give you a more accurate uh, reply then we have a discussion about uh, the same that same question is there any other safety interlocks other than safety mushroom switch well for example if you want to generate more than two kilovolts on a c2 uh, to measure C2 on a bushing, you will get a warning. But apart from that, we didn't want to limit the user too much. Of course, uh, every time when the measurement is done and when the load is being measured, so every time when you press start, we measure the load. And if we see that there is some kind of short circuit, we stop the generation. So there is also that thing. Um, uh, Mr. Haris Haj is asking if transformer has a tap changer, we conduct test with the tap in nom nominal position or the tap has to be used before the test actually it is yes it's it is usually the tap is in the nominal let's say the middle position then we have uh, Yevgeny uh, explaining something to Irfan a negative power factor is a reality in bushing with internal tracking PF will be negative do you have any literature about it so if you do please do send uh, you can choose 250, 500, etc., etc. Okay, so we will. I will check all the other correspondence for tan delta in C2 test. The values should be less than one percent. Well, uh, it depends how your bushing is done. Is it resin imp resin impregnated in paper or some other? Uh, I think the best thing would be asking your producer, because usually for bushings even lower values of tan delta are advised even though I've seen some tables where bushings for certain uh, modes of uh, production can be even up to two or three percent so that depends on how the bushing was made good explanation of tan delta for transformer any examples for generator we will do some examples for generator on Monday so please join us on Monday we did some tests in South Africa and also in Turkey uh, ta -ta -ta okay so let let me do this right now um, in order to uh, sign up for the presentation for monday uh, we will use actually a different platform we will use go to please write to veronica and if she didn't already send you the mail how to uh, subscribe or how to uh, register she will do that after this uh, 
and Raj is asking, do you also have a key that can be used for safety? Yes, Raj, thank you for reminding me. Whenever we generate, we also need to turn the key. We can see that key here. So this key is present on TD5000 and also on STS, which is here. So of course, this is another safety feature. So let me do this. Right now, I'm going to stop with the...